Well, you know, you guys have a good infrastructure. Uh, you know, part of being a volunteer team is we just don't physically have that much manpower and as many resources as the Guard has, the Army, the Air Force, etc. The ability to be able to call up and say, hey, we need, we need a bird, we need to go here, we need rehab, we need, is just absolutely invaluable for us because there are times that we will be in the field for 20 hours. There's no camping because you have to get somebody out. Especially with fires going on now, we really need to be very cognizant of the fact that if somebody gets hurt, if somebody goes down and they're in a fire location, we will need wildlands help, guards help, and a lot of people to pull together to get one person out or, you know, three people, especially after what happened in Arizona recently. Well, in one way or another, we're all volunteers. We voluntarily uh, join the Guard to serve the nation. Um, search and rescue, we do the same, except more at the local level. Uh, guard tends to go statewide. So I think just remembering that we're all uh, volunteers, public servants, who really enjoy what we do. There was a wildland fire that's been burning since uh, I think late Friday night, early Saturday morning. A uh, military, a small military aircraft had actually uh, was overflying the burn area and had some sort of mechanical failure and, and crashed in the burn area. Uh, that drove a exercise scenario of A, we had to locate the aircraft, uh, which is now missing, which is the search and rescues portion, and the National Guard had to provide some uh, firefighters uh, to come in because we're going through a lack of burn area and potentially burn at the, at the crash site. Ah! It's, it's a great opportunity, as, as I like to say, you don't want to swap business cards at a, at a real incident. Now's the time to get to know first names, faces, and all that stuff, so whenever uh, the unfortunate time comes that the real thing happens, we know some of the players and we can look at each other and, hey, remember when we were down here? And you move on. <laughs> you wanna go fast? Yeah, dude. I think this is invaluable training for everybody involved, from the county assets to the private assets, uh, to the National Guard, and with the uh, opportunity to work here on the Air Force Academy and the active duty also. All right, you're gonna be good to go, brother. All right. I'll be with you very shortly. I'm gonna go take care of the more critical victims, all right? All right, let's hurry back, man. It can't be overstated that what it, what it looks like in the air and what it looks like in the ground are completely different, and the ability to communicate back and forth so that we understand each other makes efficient use of the aircraft. We don't, we're not wasting time lining up the targets, wasting fuel, exposing people to risk that we that don't need to. And the, you can talk about it in a classroom, but when they're flying and you actually get it up there, it's a much better experience for everyone involved. Kilo 39 Anderson. 39, go ahead. Yes, sir, on your next drop, your ground contact is going to be York. York, copy. National Guard is just phenomenal at is the structure. They understand the incident command, they understand emergency response, they know how to do it in the field, they know how to do it quickly and efficiently, methodically. Those are all things that they can come and share their wisdom and experience with us. And it's it's information, it's training that's just invaluable. Every time you pick up the light, you pick up the scissors, you clean it. Well, what we're doing right now is we're assisting the scene. Normally, the fatality search and recovery team would go in later. Search and extraction is in first, but we can't get any of them on site until we get the lanes cleared. We have the lanes cleared now so that they can come in. So what we're doing is doing a temporary mortuary affairs collection point. We're not identifying any remains. We're not decontaminating any remains. We're packaging them together so that they don't get separated, so the, the person's parts stay with their remains, and then we are storing them. We don't even have a refrigerator facility right now, which is where they would normally be stored. So what we have is just a hasty mortuary setup, and our guys are doing as best they can. We're using augmentees to come down here and help us remove the deceased. So these drivers are simulated. They are animal parts that we're putting out. Right now, actually it's really cool right now because our escort team, the ones that actually go in and do this, we are a very small team. So what we've done now is we've actually pulled people in from the rest of the surf decon, search and extraction, and they've come in to help us. 
they're taking over, bagging things, lifting things, taking things over. That way we can get at least the documentation done. Did this, get one, this one get a picture? We received a call to respond to Bonfi's Blood Center. Uh, F4 tornado had touched down at uh, 03 this morning. They called us out so that we could determine whether or not a uh, radiation source that they had inside had been um, damaged and whether or not it was leaking and if we could find the two sources uh, contained within the building. Fortunately, uh, we located both sources fairly quickly. Uh, they were still contained within their, uh, what we call a pig, but it's a, just a, a shielding lead container that, uh, that they come in. In addition to that, we were tasked to uh, locate um, blood samples that they might have had uh, from just the uh, like blood IV bags that were spread all over the parking lot here. I had a spot picked out where I wanted to store the blood to keep it out of the sun. Uh, I'd probably been in suit for, I'm guessing around um, an hour and a half at that point. And uh, when I stood up, I hit my head on the stairs. Uh, which basically kind of knocked me out, I guess. I don't really know exactly what happened from that point. Uh, and then we had, uh, unfortunately, had an issue with communications that delayed the rescue initially, uh, but the team recovered from that, realized what was going on, launched rescue. They got me to, uh, to our decontamination line, uh, did their monitoring, got me out of suit completely, and did their medical monitoring. And from that point, cleared me, and uh, I was able to, to come back to, to the interview. One, two, three, five. Go to the other one. Just to con be able to continue that and stay with this line of work has is, is, uh, been a complete blessing for me. I, I love every, every minute of it, of it and I, uh, I dread the day when I have to leave the team. Fortunately, it was a fairly simple mission for us, um, but uh, uh, overall, a general success for us, I think, as well. We got called out in reference to uh, an incident that happened at this location. Uh, once we came on scene, we uh, met up with the incident commander. There was a victim that was involved in the uh, incident that happened up on the second floor of the building. It was the IC's decision that we needed to get somebody downrange as quick as possible. So we set up a hasty decon station and we got two personnel in the suit to go downrange to make their way up to the second floor and ascertain what the situation was. Once they got upstairs, uh, they found the victim in one of the rooms uh, with debris on top of her and uh, she needed some help. Uh, they called for the backup team because they felt that they needed some extra personnel to help them extract that patient out of the hot zone. So that's when uh, Sergeant Lay and I went down range to uh, help assist them. And once we finally got the uh, patient strapped in, we were able to uh, extract her with relatively little uh, incident and get her to the decon line to get her decontaminated and off to the uh, hospital. Uh, right now, uh, we're team number two. They sent us out for a breach and break mission. So we started by coming over here and then they found out there was a child that was underneath a cement block. So we changed it to split our teams up. And we have two holes being punched through here to get through the breach and break to get to the victims inside. Estimated two victims. For the lifting and hauling, we got the block out of the way. We have air going in to get all the chemicals or CO out. We gotta cut the metal and then we'll grab that patient as well. The biggest danger is we actually have to call up to a structural engineer and uh, USTAR is the one to urban search and rescue. So come out and make sure that if we start punching and vibrating that nothing's gonna fall on top of us. Okay. Today we're at the West Metro Fire Training Academy near Denver, Colorado. We've got a training lane set up for the S&E teams on rope rescue evolutions. We're instructing them on and making them more proficient at their raise and lower and repel scenarios. When the S&E teams actually have to extract patients in a disaster area, this will assist them in and setting up their systems to actually get victims out of confined space, trench, or out of a partially collapsed building. And it'll allow them better ways to get to a patient below grade. As they've gotten this additional skill identifier for 
search and rescue, um, and it's not their main job function. So it's one more perishable skill, and so the more they can train, it's no different than marksmanship. The more you can go out and shoot, the more proficient of a marksman you're gonna be. So the more you can get your hands on this type of training, uh, the better you're gonna be at it. One, two, three. What we've got today is a non-standard mission, is what we call it. Uh, we've got basically, within the scenario, tornadoes come through this area and they've wiped out a few of the resources in the hospital to make it non-occupiable by the majority of the patients. And so they've called us in to do a patient transfer. And uh, with that, we've got advanced life support, basic life support, surgery recovery, as well as uh, newborn ICU patients. And so we're gonna set up to be able to do that. We'll have medical staff on standby to stabilize patients that are needed until we can get them airlifted or ambulanced out of here. This ties in with Vigilant Guard. It's just one of the missions that we could, a real life scenario could easily be tasked to do. So it gives us an opportunity to create training outside of our, our normal everyday decon lines and things that way. So that's where we come in with Vigilant Guard is it just allows us a non-standard mission within our normal parameters. A rail car overturned in the vicinity over there by Eliches. And since Pep Center is downrange, they needed us to clear to make sure that none of those hazardous chemicals were still at, were, were inside the Pepsi Center or around the vicinity so that they could take civilians from their home and evacuate them to the Pepsi Center. Um, so our, our survey team for Colorado, they were down, they were in there just monitoring the air and making sure there wasn't any of that hazardous chemical out there. And this is a little different, just you know, looking for just making sure the air is completely clean so that if there were acidic particles in the air, the pH would catch it and they would let us know. It would let us know if there was anything dangerous. After we got the activation notice to uh, deploy our force, we deployed to Watkins Armory set up our search and extraction for casualties to recon the area, as well as set up the mass decontamination and medical triage. We received notice that uh, Watkins was hit with a uh, tornado earlier this morning. The uh, Watkins Armory was in the middle of a family day when it was, when it was hit. So now uh, we have a spilled tanker out here with some diesel, uh, some possible other chemicals in the air, so we have to go full suit. If you can walk and you can hear my voice, come to me. We are conducting an exercise on uh, clearing a large public venue of a potential chemical hazard. While our survey team member was downrange, he developed chest pain, uh, so he had to be extracted. So we had a 21-year-old uh, male who somehow developed uh, chest pain with no prior history, no symptoms. So it was kind of a freak uh, type of heart attack, uh, basically is what it seems like. Might not be a heart attack, there's a lot of things it could be. The work on over. My primary responsibility is to uh, provide emergency medical services uh, to this team and then also um, medical monitoring support. All right, man, so I take a real quick look at him. You're doing all right? You know where you are? You know what's going on? You're just having some chest pain? Yep. Okay, so we would do a transfer right here. One, two, three, transfer, civilian EMS takes them off. So mission uh, drives what we do. One person who's stabilized goes to the hospital, we, we keep going.